Welcome to the third season of Between the Lines, the podcast that brings you interviews with some lesser-known Canadian authors and writers. In this season, we will be exploring some of the works of these unknown but talented poets from various locations across this great country. From the breathtaking landscapes of the far north to the bustling downtown city streets, these writers have captured the essence of Canada in their words. In each episode, we will delve into the lives and careers of these fascinating individuals, learning about their inspirations, challenges, and their triumphs. So join us as we discover the hidden gems of Canadian literature and uncover the stories Between the Lines. Hello and welcome to Between the Lines. On today's show, I will be speaking with the author Lee F. Patrick. Hello, Lee, and welcome to Between the Lines. Hello, Randy. Uh, thanks for choosing me to be one of your guests. Um, it's going to be a great time. I like to think these are great times. And, uh, you know, I've, the feedback I've gotten has been, it's not been time wasted. So that's uh, something I like to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we get into the nitty gritty of the show, um, I wonder if you'd mind... Uh, giving our listeners a, a brief, uh, what's the word I want to use here, rundown on who Lee F. Patrick is and what Lee is about. Well, I first started reading very young uh, and concentrating on science fiction and fantasy. Uh, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey with my sister in the theater when it first came out. Okay. We wondered what that funny smell was, you know. <laughs> Uh, and thanks to my parents, we also had a subscription to the Science Fiction Book Club. You may remember that back from back in the day. My husband and I still have a lot of books from those early days and reread them on occasion. We'll just dive back into into that, you know, that that golden age of of science fiction and fantasy. Mm. But you know, tastes have changed over the years, and book sizes definitely have. I always have a book or two on the go now when uh like when I read need to clear my head, I pull out the book. And sometimes when a new series uh, a new book in a series uh comes out, I go back to the beginning so that I can follow that overarching plot development. So it's okay. actually research. That that's my you know, yep, yep, yep. That's the other way to call it, yep. Yeah. Well, Seeing what hints are in book one that may have been written four or five or six or more years ago that aren't really explained, but when they show up later, you go, wait a minute, I remember that bit. Mm, okay. So it's something that I, I try and work into my own writing is, okay, in book one, this weird thing happens and it's not really explained, but it goes on. After I... Uh, finished university, I, I was doing science, uh, biochemistry research, and but I never really stopped reading and imagining other adventures of both book and TV movie characters. Today, you know, that's fan fiction. Back then, it was like overactive imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, I, eventually, I, I did uh, start to listen to the voices in my head and write down the more original stories that I was inventing. Uh, my first novel, when I reread it after some publishing adventures, I went, oh, this sucks. And it was it was back in the day when you had to send in the physical copy. So it was a big stack of paper, mm -hmm. you know, double, double spaced. It, it was big. Uh, it looked bigger than it really was. Oh, yeah. Uh, but when I reread it, I went, oh. This sucks. So I made a point form outline. Well, the, the, I still love the story. Mm -hmm. I still love the characters. I love the way I took care of the villain. It's like, yes. But the writing, it was essentially one of the first big things I'd ever written. So, but uh, it probably needs rewriting again before I try uh, finding it a home. Anyway, the, the poetry part sort of snuck in sideways. Um, while I don't write a lot of them, I've really enjoyed that process, uh, especially with the, the different structure I'm using. And 
nowadays other than authoring. I keep going on walks to keep my leg muscles strong since I need two new hips. And uh, my other job is in finance, which gives me yet more ideas for writing. <laughs> um, I've been married to the same wonderful guy for most of my life, and we do a lot of things together, including writing. He's he's also an author. Oh, wonderful. And we have the four cats right now. Uh, two are black and two tuxedo. One of them's an older rescue who came from Nova Scotia and was very confused about everything when he came out of the box here. The Alberta way of life is a little difficult. Well, it was also much higher because he came from sea level. Ah. And there was all the wrong smells and all the wrong everything, but uh, Jackie has adapted. And I'm actually thinking about doing a little a picture book with Jackie the Brave. Jackie but, the Brave. Well, I have it, a... it was, you know, all, all of a sudden, everything of his life changed. Uprooted, yep. Yep. I have a and, tuxedo uh, cat. Yeah. Um, of the other three, uh, one's a tuxedo, the other two are all black. And they came from a farm a few years ago and really freaked out Jackie because, oh, my God, what are these things? And they thought, <laughs> oh, he's he's running. He wants us to play chase. Yeah. He's like me. So, so you know, that that's sort of the kind of things I do. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a, that's a good let's get to know who Lee is. So thank you for that. Um, normally at this juncture, um, I would jump right into what I have called question period because really what's an interview without questions. Uh, but yep. because we're focusing on Canadian poets and their poetry, we're going to give you an opportunity now, if you have one selected to, um, read a poem for us. This one is, uh, called Shadows in the Mist. And, I tend to write in a Celtic style, so a couple of lines the same and then one one different. But this is actually a horror story. Lovely. So, I hear the shadows in the mist. I feel the peck specters of the mist. They promise power and they know pain. Boasting in bright light is easy. Jesting at old tales is easy. Drink clouds the mind of sense. Misty forms surround me. Shadows of the dead surround me, whispering their sorrows to ensnare my soul. Their stench is of the graveyard. Their place is in the graveyard. The boast I made is forgotten in fear. Street lights grow, glow weakly from beyond the wall. Shadows separate from tombs within the wall. Tolling the hours of midnight, the clock stops. I hear the trees moving in the breeze. I feel the shadows traveling with the breeze. The coldness of the mist surrounds my heart. Mist and darkness are all around me. Shadows of the trees wrap around me. Their branches ensnare me, darkening my soul. They draw me through darkness and moving shadows. They lead me toward blackness and moving shadows. The river flows silently under the sorrowing trees. Tombstones glow pale in the swirling mist. Terrible faces take form from the swirling mist. Water sur rises around me, stealing the air from my lungs. I hear shouts from beyond the darkness. I feel the caress of those who live in darkness. The tightness in my chest relaxes, and I smile. Mist parts from the darting lights. Shadows slink away from the darting lights. Voices disturb the stillness and the hate. They stumble and trip among the scattered stones. They cannot see the truth of the scattered stones. I watch their hopes vanish from the depths of shadows. Dawn comes slowly in the shadowed realm. Daylight never shines in the shadowed realm. The living should keep to their own places. I hear the shadows in the mist. I feel the specters of the mist. They promised power, and I knew pain. 
So listening to that, I, it was very moving and very powerful, but I, I, I was transformed or transferred back to probably one of my many drunken and drug reduced stages that I felt and, and probably could have said all that. Yeah. <laughs> I, yep. I don't mean any offense by that, but um, it, it's good when words can take you back it, or two places, right? So yeah. um, what, what does this poem mean to you? Well, I was, I actually wrote it originally for a Halloween reading. And I wanted to, to do something uh, in, in the, the Celtic style of poetry. And drunk people shouldn't go wandering through graveyards on Samhain. <laughs> or at all, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually also have a prose version of that, but it, it's not not quite as powerful because there are, there are more words. I think, I think the, the poetry, because the, the, the words, are, you know, you have to pick each word. Mm -hmm. Um, it gives that a lot more weight than to be in the head of the idiot who's wandering around the graveyard <laughs> drunk <laughs> with a frat party. How long did that take you to write? Um, I'm not sure. I actually wrote it in like in 2016, 2015. I'm not exactly sure. Um, it was nominated for the Poetry uh, Pre Aurora Award in 2017. Okay. So it made it into the top five. It didn't win, but. You know, I only heard about this, uh, the uh, Aurora Awards just earlier this year. Yeah. They've been going on for, for a very long time. They're great Somebody fun. that I actually interviewed, uh, she's been a finalist on that. Yeah. So um, she she wants to nominate my podcast next year. So Very true. I, I don't know if that's a, a genre within the Aurora Awards, but. Yeah, the, there's a um, a section for, for things like podcasts and blogs and whatnot. Oh, well, then there you go. Yeah, I'll vote for you. All right. I like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do this just simply for the love of doing it. Uh, I don't do it for fame. I don't do it for money. Uh, I just do it because I believe that there's a lot of people out there, such as yourself and, you know, uh, all the other people that I've interviewed that need exposure and they're not getting it from the big five or, you know, they're not getting that push that they need somewhere else. Yeah. Well, marketing is hard. Isn't it though? <laughs> it, it is. Um, well, thank you for that first poem and, and a brief rundown about what it meant to you and, and all that sort of stuff that we covered. We're going to go into question period uh, right now. And so question number one is, who introduced you to poetry uh, and with what? Well, I first became actually interested in reading more poems and writing them while researching Celtic culture uh, after suffering through various poetry modules in English class. I was very relieved that once I was out of high school, I didn't have to take more English classes. <laughs> uh, I also have some works where the main character needs to take language classes, and often they don't like them either. They just don't understand why the heck they need to bother about theme and whatnot and analyzing the witchness of the why. And yeah. What was that, anyway, the witchness of the why? The witchness of the why. <laughs> that sounds like a good uh, book title. Could be. Uh, anyway, the, the two to three lines, similar last line, different format of, of the Celtic poems uh, gave me a framework to work with. Um, I've done a number of poems with Celtic themes, such as the Wild Hunt, uh, Elemental Guardians, the Islands of the Blessed, where souls go to rest until they're reborn. Uh, and I, as I said, I started writing multiple versions of, of some of the short stories as either poem or prose, like the the one I just read. There, There's the pro poetry version. There's also the prose version. You know, it, it gives that. Part of the reason I started doing that was to try challenging myself to write in in the different formats and going, OK, what what are the rules of, of poetry, of prose? And also I did some monologues, which were actually quite fun uh, because they're all spoken. So you have to, you know, how do you describe some things that are happening 
because it's essentially all dialogue. Mm -hmm. So they were quite fun. One of the things I'm working on is a collection of the poems and the related stories. It's slowly coming together, but I'm, I'm one of the reasons I'm not pushing hard on it is that I'd like to have most more of either the poems or the short stories, both pu published in other venues. Right. So, so, you know, you, you, you put them out there and then you, you do the collection. Um, it is hard to find poetry markets that get this format as it is archaic. I, I've had some comments back when I've sent a poem out in one particular poem, it, they alternate between the, 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 the first lines end in either sea or land. And they didn't like that. <laughs> it was like, but it's the format that's there. And they were like, no, we don't like that. And it's like, ah, so last uh, summer at When Words Collide and, and even the summer before that, I had some, uh, some compliments from uh, established poets like Wakefield Brewster, who's the current poet laureate of Calgary, and Bob Stallworthy, who's a, a local Calgary poet, during our, our poetry panels. And, uh, you know, they, they thought, yeah. And actually, Bob Stallworthy he said, yes, you should write that collection or do the collection with the, the poem and then the related stories. Well, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Are you going to let a publishing house or a publisher or an editor or an agent or dictate what you can and can't do or what you should and shouldn't do? I mean, yeah. it's your creative. Yeah. The, the, these are my, my stories. This came all out of my brain. So yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have fun with it and, you know, make it, make it go. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Um, just touching on that first question again, though. Uh, so did you actually read poetry first or did you write poetry first? Well, I had to read it in high school and which is when I discovered I am not into romantic anythings because I start, well, actually when I was quite young, I, I, I was, ver, as I said, a voracious reader. And for some reason, my parents had a copy of the book Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott in, in the house. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Um, where they got it from but it was like okay i'm going to read this and i stalled on the first chapter completely i got halfway down the first page and went no put it back on the shelf <laughs> i finally started with chapter two which is when the action starts okay. um so i i've read some poems over the years and some of them i get others i'm like what so, so I really started to write when I started to write them in, like I say, to do the research on, on the Celtic, um, the, what their bards were doing. And I went, oh, this is pretty neat because it's a story. It's not a, a tone poem sort of thing. Yeah. Um, which, you know, although with Wakefield's poetry, you won't, you have to hear it rather than read it. I found, I started, tried reading some of his, but it, it, it doesn't have the impact of the spoken word. So maybe if I'd heard those poems read, I would have gone, Oh, that makes much more sense. Fair enough. So it's, Fair enough. Because we, we, you know, hearing things as opposed to reading them. It, it goes into our brain differently. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know what, but in <laughs> not everybody knows how to read poetry. So it has to be somebody who knows how to handle the spoken word with regards to poetry. Oh yeah. And like I say, Wakefield is, is awesome. Uh, if you ever get a chance to hear him live, um, yay, or, or even recorded. So your, your poem that you first read there, um, uh, is is a lengthy poem and maybe not quite an epic, but do you like the epics or no? Well, how how long does it take to tell the story? And that that's kind of where the the time goes. All right, so length. I'm thinking of Beowulf. 
yeah, that, that's one of your, your big epics. <laughs> and the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Yeah. And I don't think I'm ever going to write anything that long, but <laughs> in poetry, um, but, you know, certainly for these, you know, distilling down the story of, you know, drunk frat boy there, uh, and the, the other one, uh, the next one I'm going to read is also a, a, a condensed story. Okay. But it is, um, yeah, I, I guess it's sort of on the, on the epic side, but I have trouble writing things that are very, very short. One of the books I'm, uh, anthologies I'm in uh, with Lynn Tucson Press is the, uh, the Drabble Advent Calendar. <laughs> and of course, the drabble being a hundred word story, and I'm like, mother of God, uh, ye, how there's can a, I scrunch something down into a hundred words? There's a gentleman in my uh, my writing group on Facebook who uh, who loves those drabbles. Oh yeah, <laughs> I have trouble with flash, and you know, it's going. Yes, it's going. No, it's not. Yes, it's growing. No, it, it's it's screech, screeching in, down into. The, <laughs> Thousand words, words is come like, on. Ah, hundred thousand word book. I'm your gal. But <laughs> question number two: When you write, do you stick with a certain topic? For example, love, death, uh, nature, etc. Or do you just write whatever comes out? Well, again, for the, for the Celtic poems, I have a story I want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever that that story is that's and it could be about love nature or death or life or isn't that celtic poetry just to in general yeah yes and actually uh, a lot of times when i'm writing both either poetry or prose um i have some celtic um song uh, albums on my playlist oh nice and i can't but i can't have lyrics that i understand because i'll start singing along with it but if it's in if it's in you know, welsh or whatever or just or an instrumental it just you know it just goes in i i don't get distracted and, and the words come out i can track with that <laughs> yeah um for another book actually one of the uh, young men who has to deal with uh, having language classes but he has a horrible past but when he reads some po they they get to a poetry module and he's reading some of these poems and going that will help me under you know it, it putting his feelings about that past to help him deal with the deal with the horror that that he had to live through mm -hmm. um so that that was kind of a weird thing to write um them because i had to be the young man with the horrible past doing poetry. <laughs> Have you read so my biography or what? <laughs> yeah, no, I've had, you know, quite a, you know, normal, normal life, but, uh, but again, try, you know, getting into his headspace to was really quite odd, but. Uh, How did you they, manage they, it then? Um, it, it I think worked pretty well. Um, and do you think you captured it adequately? I think so. But I, when I'm, when that book ever um, comes closer to, to being out, I'm going to have um, some, some people I know who have uh, training in psychology. Um, check them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like having uh, in, in one of my other novels, I have a trans character. So I asked people who are trans, um, am I getting this right? Yeah. And and they said, yeah, sure. The The character may have other adventures, but they're going to be about them. Not the, you know, not big thing that, yes, I, you know, this character is trans. And it was sort of like, this is this character's, you know, further adventures. Yeah. No, and, that's, uh, you know. It, it's good to do research. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you really don't want to screw it up. You know? Well, no. 
But at the same time, I mean, if you've got the life experience that can go with what you're writing, that's one thing because you're drawing on what you know and not yeah. what you're speculating. Yeah. Uh, and what you know may be different today than it was when you knew it, but you still know it. Yeah. Um, and then other times you're, you know, well, I have books about shapeshifters and nope, not one of them. Uh, but the, they have some of the same problems that, that everybody else does, you know, um, how can they deal with the world and what they are? So I shapeshift yeah. all the time. It's called dieting. <laughs> well, I, I have a guy who turns into a cougar. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I lived on the streets for many, many years across Canada and my nickname was bear. And at many times I did take on the personality of a bear you didn't want to cross my path yeah the 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 cougar is sort of you know sort of in the back of of my main of that character's head when really wants to just protect him all the time Mm -hmm. but uh but yeah it it certainly um it was fun or i've got one more in that series in his story to tell but then there are going to be other shapeshifter stories sounds Um, like you've got some busy times ahead Oh yeah. Um <laughs> I've got so many things on my hard drive that aren't quite finished yet. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I've actually got a folder that says unfinished and um yeah. like I said, you know, the previous year's poetry goes into the next year's book and right now there's 95 unfinished pieces. So mm. there might be two books next year. <laughs> yeah. Uh question number 3. If you could put a number on it, how many poems would you say you've written? Well, I I, I went went through the the poetry. Uh, I, I tend to put the poetry into folders specifically. Uh, there's about fifteen. Okay. Um, some of them aren't completed. Um, one was. Uh, I started originally as a memorial to to someone who had passed, and I've never gotten back to it, so mm. I really need to to do that. Uh, but yeah, and and doing doing some more uh, poetry, um, which is easier I'm to write for you. Also, I'm also writing um, Kel- fantasy Celtic in that are that's based on on Celtic culture types of things okay. so I'm, I'm going to be adding in poems as spells as you know the, the one character talking to another perhaps even little um, things at the beginning of chapters so fair enough um, what's easier for you to write poems or fiction uh, prose is easier um, because I just download the, you know, the story in my head. It just goes blah, 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 in, into when I'm really in the zone. It just flows out through my fingers into the, through the, the keyboard. Um, poetry, I have to think about more. Odd. Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, some of them have just, the idea for them is, is, you know, very simple to, you know, sort of, okay, here's, the, here's the idea. Now, how to construct the poem because like I say with doing the some lines the same and then the different one that that needs some back and forth to uh to get that to come out especially if I'm alternating things like the C and the land uh, for each stanza I can't go C C land land C C or C land C land sand land land land. There's got to be a format. There, there's got to be the format so that that takes more higher brain function than just letting the the story flow out. Okay, so when it comes to writing a poem, um, would you rather would you rather work it in form or function? So does it have to read it and look a certain way or is it about the form of it all? Like what you just said, Lancy, yeah, Lancy, Lancy. Yeah, well, I might start writing it in one, you know, sort of just just to get 
the story into the thing and and into the form and then go okay well then the editing phase it might be oh well this won't work i need to move this here i need to that's a really clunky sentence <laughs> you've uh, read my poetry oh yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, some sentences, she are goodly spoke there. <laughs> but I understood it. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, and sometimes um, even writing prose, I tend to invert clauses. So I have to, again, that's one of the things in the editing phase is you, you read it out loud and going, okay, what the heck was I doing there? <laughs> Just after uh, I lost my vision or most of my vision, I took a, a, a course through the Hadley School for the Blind, and the course was Elements of Poetry. Uh, it's, you know, 20, 25 years since I'd been in school, and I didn't know if I could do school, so I took the easiest thing I could find. And the instructor suggested going back to an old poem and editing it or rewriting it. And mm -hmm. that boggled my mind because I was always of the belief, and I don't know where it came from, but I was always of the belief that once it has gone from my mind to paper, that's the way it was meant to be, and to leave it alone. And I never edited any of my poetry. And when I when I learned that, it was like, what? You can edit poetry? And apparently you can. It's a thing, really. Well, if you were writing a haiku, you, you really need to, you might, you know, put it all, you know, put the idea down just so that you've got that as a reference and then go, okay, now how many syllables do I have left? I know all these things, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. So I, again, so the, the question was, is uh, how many poems have you written? But let's put a twist on that. You write prose and fiction. Um, how many words have you written since you started writing? Can you put a number um, on that? Actually, I can give you an estimate because I am way anal about some things. <laughs> and I have, I've been tracking my writing numbers. So I don't do NaNoWriMo because I'd rather write all over, I, I, I write completely, you know, whatever needs to happen. So I don't, you know, 50,000 words in a month is, I, no, I'm not doing that. Um, this month I'm up to, um, uh, I'm up to 21,000 words. Okay. Oh, actually, no, November, a, a little less than 8,000 for the year, 214,000. And since I started keeping track in 2013, um, over 3 million. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Most of those are um, prose. Okay. So. And how many of those will ever see the light of day? Um, in, depends on if I stop getting new ideas and actually work on editing the ones that I haven't finished yet. <laughs> uh, I think every writer listening can relate to that. <laughs> oh yeah, um, I, I've got whole series that probably just need to be completely rewritten mm -hmm. uh, again because um, 2013 was quite a few years ago now, nine years, and over that time I've grown as a writer and and learned more about the craft of writing and you know getting getting all the bits in there and you know so i may still love the the characters the plot and whatnot but like that first novel that i wrote um i just just make a you know point form outline of the thing and start from chapter one mm. And yeah. just go, okay, this happens in chapter one. Okay, there we go. But rewriting it completely. You uh, you mentioned NaNoWriMo. Oh, NaNoWriMo. Rimo. Yeah. Oh, that's for the poetry. 
No, that's prose. the National Novel Writing Month. Oh, okay. Where not... one one is supposed to write 50,000 words in yes. the month of November. Yes. Um, so I, I made a confession online yesterday on Facebook. The reason why I do not participate in that, because uh, spending one month writing will take me two years to edit. <laughs> Yeah. And that um, is that is the the absolute truth. But anyway. Yeah. Well, and uh, apparently um literary agent uh, publication agents really hate in about uh, January because people start sending in what they wrote for NaNoWriMo uh to an agent and of course they really haven't been edited and you know they they just cringe sometimes. I bet. Uh, I'm just for me. It's more of a of the visual impairment thing because that's yeah. it takes even longer. Um, do you have another poem? You said you had one, but uh, this is your opportunity yeah. to read another poem. Do you have okay. one? I do indeed. Uh, this is called "The Hunter Hunts On," which has actually given rise to three different stories: two short and one a short novella. And oh, one nice. of those shorts has been accepted and waiting on publication. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So it's, it's again, it's, you know, I guess it's kind of an epic thing happening again. The hunter hunts on. Mist descends the darkening hills. Mist hides the trees and the meadows. Mist covers the paths through the forest. The white stag is all the hunters see. Hounds pant as they give chase. Hounds give tongue as the stag falters. Hounds strain against their leads. The creak of leather and hoofbeats fills the silence. Men fix their eyes on shapes in the mist. Men shoot arrows toward the half-seen stag. Men vanish into the mist as their horses tire. The king rides on and does not see them. Hounds join the chase from the mist. Hounds with white bodies and heads the color of blood. Hounds all attention to the white stag fleeing. The packs combine and hunt as one. Men come from the mist led by one in shades of gray. Men with dead eyes and silent voices. Men riding shadowed horses through the mist. The king sees them and spurs his horse on. Two f spears fly stagward through the mist. Two spears, one bronze and one of iron. Two spears striking as one in the stag's heart. Kings claim the kill with eyes flashing. Men gather round the fallen stag in wonder. Men leash the tired hounds, the brindled and the white. Men hold their weapons ready in silence. The kings pull their spears from the stag. Two human eyes meet two other eyes. Two beings stand ready to battle. Two kings stay their hands from the swords. Human king thrusts his spear in the ground. Forest king smiles and his hounds mill about him. Forest king thrusts his spear in the stag. Forest king's hunters bring torches and mead. The hall doors open and the bright fires beckon. Great is the feasting, guesting the men and their king. Great is the cauldron that sits in the fire. Great is the portion allotted the king. Forest king gifts him with the champion's cup. Late is the hour, the moon setting full. Late yawns the king, eyes heavy with sleep. Late the men grumble, stumbling to horses. A guide to the haunts of men stand near. Mist rises up the lightning mountains. Mist creeps away from the trees and the meadows. Mist reveals the path through the forest. The white stag's hide gleams in the morning sun. The hunter hunts on. So, as you read... I saw the video going through my head. Does that make sense? Yep. And uh, yeah, no, it. Uh, I was able to follow in my head with that video, and it. Uh, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, and uh, like I say, the, there's there's also the prose versions, and it started with why it is a bad time, a, a bad idea to go hunting stag on Samhain night, <laughs> which is Halloween. Yep, yep. Although in in the Celtic countries, Samhain is actually the three nights of the full moon. Because they didn't really have the calendar we have today. No. They needed a different way of tracking things. And doing things. Yeah. And the moon's that, really easy to see. Yeah, absolutely. Even for, for a blind guy? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that one with us as well. Uh, when you first started writing poetry, uh, were you the show-it-to-everyone kind of person? or um, Or were you the hide-it-to-yourself? Oh, the definitely keep it to myself um, type. Although when I, one of the things that helped me get, uh, start putting it out was the, you know, okay, well, I need, you know, I I, I need to get val- something about needing validation. Like, can other people actually understand this and like it? The um, Shadows in the Mist, I, I sent to... Um, Polar Borealis, which is uh, Graham Cameron's uh, magazine. And he he emailed me back saying, I really don't understand this, but I really like it. <laughs> and so he published it. Huh? And now he also has, a, there's a companion, uh, Polar Starlight, which is only poetry. Okay. But he's still um, publishing some poems. Wonderful. I know for me personally, when I first started writing poetry, it was more of a, just a way to get everything that was inside me uh, out. And, and it was for personal reasons, right? It was yeah. nothing to be shared with or about. And one day I actually left my book lying out and a friend picked it up and started reading without you know permission and said, why aren't you sharing this? Because I know a lot of people that would understand that and feel the same way. And Blah, 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 blah. And after that, it was like, okay. And I started sharing. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, for, for me to begin with, it was just <clears throat> for personal reasons to get all that angst and still, you know, I started writing when I was a teenager, right? For over yeah. 40 years ago. Uh, who do you write for? Um, Mostly for myself, uh, though I do hope that other people will enjoy what I've written. Uh, I say I still go through some of the older books on on the hard drive and reread them, usually finding places to groan at with the writing, but enjoying the stories at the core. Um, I also, which is a pro- somewhat of a problem, I tend to have a lot of ideas, quite a few of them from dreams. Um, so I have documents that I call bits files, B-I-T-S. Okay. I'm up to number eight, uh, which has... <laughs> Um, a lot of words in it is present. I'll start a new one in January. I write out what I recall of the dream. And then if there's things I'm, you know, go, you know, the awake mind goes, you know, you sort of wake up from the dream and go, what the hell was going on there? And and I'll try and fix the the details in my mind and then go, well, does this make sense as a story? Or as the the genesis of a story. Uh, so then, when I wake up, I'll write down uh, what I recall, and then add the awake uh, things. Some of them never go beyond that initial. Gosh, that was a really weird dream. And I was like, "What the heck is going on with my no subconscious kidding. there?" And others <clears throat> demand a lot more attention and take on a life of their own. And that happened earlier this month. Uh, there are now two storylines I've come up with in that world set in different times in the world's history. One more modern, the other definitely medieval. And it's like, it may not go any further than that. But like I say, I'm trying to get more um, of the backlog of the not quite ready books to the ready stage and uh, both in um novellas and and full novels but uh you know (laughs) it it sounds like what happens to you 
um, happened. Well, I know it, it sounds like it's the same thing that happens to me. And I bet you there's uh, oodles more of other writers who would say, yep, yep. But like you're in the middle of writing something and something you just wrote inspires something else totally unrelated. Yep. It, it just. And then you have and it won't let you alone. Nope. And, you know, every time you know, you're trying to go to sleep and it's going, hi, I've just thought of what happens next. And it's like, no, <laughs> I want to sleep. Yeah. What do you see as a drawback to self-publishing a, a book of poetry? Well, and this, I think, would also work with, with the, the trad poetry books. Uh, is the reaching the wider audience, not just people who like poetry, mm -hmm. but trying to get other people to go, oh, yes, this is a good thing. You know, yes, buy this book of poetry because it's it speaks to you and but people need to know about it, which is, the you know, marketing. I said the, the collection uh, will have the prose and the poetry version mm -hmm. of, of the same story. So that may help market it to the non-poetry reading public and they might oh go oh well hey this poem is is pretty neat i wonder what else there is in poetry the trad publishers also know how to market poetry collections um and that aren't to just you know hi he's here's the people who usually read poetry and we'll just you know they just market to them do they do they try and go wider and that's that's kind of the problem True um, enough. when you're self-published or, or a very small press uh, it's research um, to find those markets and publishing wide can also help readers to find the books because some people don't like the big Amazon thing. They, they, they would rather buy from anywhere else. There are but those people. Amazon yes. is one of, is the big, the big spot. True enough, but I mean, I've had, I've had family say, "Oh, publish the book, self-publish it, I'll buy it," and they never buy it, but they always say, "Hey, you know what? Why don't you send me a, a free autographed copy?" And family yeah. very seldomly ever buy. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. Um, I have friends who will buy. You know, pretty much no matter what I write, they're they're like, "Oh yes, we're going to buy that," and they actually do. Um, but it's finding other people. Mm -hmm. to to buy the book whether it's online or or in person of writing publishing or marketing and i think we've already talked about what do you struggle the most with well it, it is the marketing there are so many options uh you know and you get the facebook ads or amazon ads or whoever's ads things like book quote Wednesday. And unfortunately, I'm usually busy in the morning on Wednesday. So I, I did one, I, I really got to get back to doing that. You know, having the Facebook content keep coming out, um, you know, saying here is this happening? <clears throat> Plus, you know, finishing various works, um, sending stuff out to markets. Yeah. Uh, for the anthology and magazines, um, you know the big, the big five or four, or however few they're down to now. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, they they spend money on on their big name authors. They don't tend to spend money on the little guys, uh, and just simply the the time it takes for them to put out a book. I know some people who have, who, you know, they're like, yeah, I can do, I can publish one book a year with these people and it takes two years to come out. You know, so. Meanwhile, you've, uh, smaller, uh, you've written five books. Smaller publishers can be, uh, can be better, but they also don't have a lot of bucks for marketing. True enough. And this, that's part of the reason why I, I'm doing this podcast is to give those writers who maybe can't get into those big five or four and a half or whatever, uh, who won't even give them the time of day. And like on my Facebook group, 
uh, Canadian creative writers we, we talked about it earlier. Uh, Wednesdays in particular, it's funny you should mention Wednesdays, but um, I, I put out or I have what's called the Wednesday Crow, which is an opportunity for anybody in the group to brag about what they've got out there or what they're doing. <laughs> and so, you know, like my group's up to over 1,300 people. Well, that's instantly 1,300 people who have access to what you're bragging about. Yeah. Which is yeah. better than, you know, nothing. Yeah. And uh, because they you know, may know somebody who who would like that book you've bragged about, and go, oh look, I can tag my my buddy so and so because they like, you know, shapeshifter books. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So, and uh, yeah, so it's that is why I do this, and I I really love doing this for for anybody who wants to be a part of it, and which I thank you for that, by the way. Um, so that's seven questions, but guess what? There's a mysterious eighth question Ooh. that I never tell anybody ahead of time. Uh-huh. So you're in trouble now. All right. Question number eight. If you could have a sit down with any poet, alive or dead or past or present, uh, and pick their brain, who would it be and why? Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, actually talking to like, Maybe the guy who wrote Beowulf or, or, or Italiason or one of the, these Celtic poets that I'm trying to echo, mm-hmm. uh, assuming we could actually understand one another, you know, in English as she were goodly spoke at the time is, is sometimes impenetrable. Uh, I, I got a big smile on my face, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. One of the, um, books that I, I've, uh, read recently it, it's actually a book from 1535 and it's on the 24 uh stones that have magical properties and describes them and it is written in 1535 english and <laughs> you have to read it out loud because you, otherwise you have no chance <laughs> to understand what the words are unless but, you've read a king james bible uh no even before that oh my it, it's worse chaucer oh i got through chaucer yeah and reading it out loud works a lot better uh you know what that's the the beauty of being visually impaired because i i can have my computer read to me uh, well hey that's a good thing <laughs> sometimes yeah. i don't know have you heard computer lingo <laughs> um actually the the a lot of people are now using that to re- have the computer read the book to them so, or, yeah. or the story to them so that then uh, for, for the editing, so they don't have to read it to themselves out loud. They can just put the headphones on and get the computer to read it. That's what I do. Go, okay, pause. No, I need to fix that bit. Well, the, the Microsoft uh, read aloud, um, the voices aren't really all that good and they don't get the intonations and all that yeah. stuff that make a poem a poem or whatever. Yeah. But if you actually go into, uh, I can't even remember one, one word or I can't even remember what it is now. There, but... there are others out there that, that do that. So Okay. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what advice would you give a new poet? Um, to write. Try writing different types of poetry. Um, read lots of poems of the different types and see what resonates with you, makes you happy. Um, take classes. Uh, but know that the teachers may have, you know, preferences as to what they consider good poetry. Um, so maybe read something they've written and, you know, get get some feedback on, on that. But you have to write. There's a lot of good free courses out there as well, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, even just learning what, you know, what makes a haiku, you know. Um, if you want to write haiku, you you need to read them. And, uh, that's something that, that you just have to do. Some of them are going to be crap. Some of them may always be crap and others may go, oh, wait a minute. It worked. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that's, that's pretty solid advice. Just keep writing. Yep. And learn your craft. Uh, getting critiques from people. Um, 
I've had some mixed critiques. Um, one of my novels is set on another world, and I said, the tech level is about here. And one of the critiquers spent the entire critique saying, no, you're, you're in, a, in it, that it was not on Earth. And they went, <laughs> they were, the, the total critique was on why this wasn't like Earth. It's like, dude, did you read the, the instructions? It's not Earth. It's never going to be Earth. It's a very different planet. I made it all up. Yeah. Yeah. So having somebody critique um your, your poems, your your prose, whatever, um you know, take take all advice with a, a half a pound of salt. Well, um, they say you have to have thick skin to be a writer, right? Yeah. Well, I had uh, I went into a, an Odyssey style um workshop a few years back. And the story I, I submitted, uh, it was actually um, a young part, part of a young adult fantasy. And of the 12 people, six of them liked my monster and six of them said, you know, that monster is completely impossible because da 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 It's a fantasy novel. I There's forget that, magic. though. I can have a scorpion that's the size of a Clydesdale if I want do <laughs> keep it away from me though please <laughs> oh yeah no well, well that's another one i need to get back to okay well maybe we'll look forward to that one day yeah. um we're going to move into the part two which is called shameless plugging yeah. and of course obviously that's about saying this is who you are and what you've got and where you can get it so uh, let's get right into that uh what books do you currently have available on the market and where can people find them um okay sort of by series assassin's justice which is about uh my main character there barrett is both a financial analyst and an assassin but he only kills people who are bad very bad um, there are four things out there. Uh, three are novellas and one's the full novel. So we have Recruit, um, sort of in, in order of how they should be read. We have Recruit, Alter Egos, which is the novel, Man's Best Friend, and Confession. Um, they are on Amazon and Kobo. Confession is also much wider. I'm working on draft to digital, um, wide distribution and again that's another marketing thing that i need to do mm -hmm. uh then we have the coalition of shifters uh there's also four titles out there uh the first is two short stories it's sort of the the prequel talking about ethan who is the fellow who turns into a cougar okay the first one is ethan and monster uh then we have three novels lonely together Always My Love, and Now and Forever. There is going to be a fourth one to round out his his stories, but there are also more uh, stories in progress. And again, Amazon and Kobo. Just one in the Mind Games series, The Alanyo Air. Uh, this is actually the one uh, where I got that review where the person just talked about why it wasn't Earth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not Earth. Hello. But the same thing with the Assassin's Justice. It's not Earth, but it's Earth like. Um the the cousins are trying for a um uh, hostile takeover of the family corporation. In the Trading Plans uh series, which is science fiction, uh we're getting out into the into the world. Uh, into the cluster, uh, ships and whatnot, all kinds of fun things. Uh, the Karina Project is one of the very early stories in this, where a black ops group on uh, on Earth decide they want telepaths who can uh, get around and and do uh, you know find find out the secrets that everyone has, and then the world finds out they have telepaths, so they have to get rid of them, which is you know tough um there are four four novels 
that are nearly ready to go in this same thing with uh, and and the the descendants of of the characters in the Karina project go off and they they can do other things. So that's it's always good to be able to do other things. Yeah. Well, uh, the next one that's the one that may come out next is um, the great 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 grandson of the main characters. And he's on a ship uh, uh, trading uh, amongst the uh, amongst the stars, and there's pirates. So great fun. And what podcast is not complete without a good pirate story? Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with uh, Lynn Tucson Press, I'm in uh, two of their anthologies so far. One called Small Shifts. And the Drabble Advent Calendar that I mentioned earlier. Uh, <laughs> small shifts are very small shifters, like Mosquito and Snowshoe Hare and Hamster, which is also a really fun story. Uh, I did the Snowshoe Hare, but I, I, I have a soft spot for the hamster. Uh, <laughs> I had a hamster called Karma once. Yeah. Um, I have poetry um, in uh, mostly Polar Borealis. Islands of the Blessed was in number 20. Ton Style is in number 17. The Giant's Dance is in number 13. And Shadows in the Mist is in number 4. Uh, Polar Borealis is free to download. I also published one, uh, The Fir Tree, which I'm going to read in a bit. Uh, it was in a, a magazine, which is unfortunately now defunct, called Antrivis Moore. Um, but you know, magazines come, magazines go. It is what it is. Yeah. Uh, so that that's sort of the what's out there right now. I actually had all the books to read um, uh, links and, but yeah. I thought we would be, I could put it up as a, in the chat or something, but. Well, you know what? You can just uh, email me all the links and I'll try to incorporate them into the uh, transcription. Okay, I will. I think you have most of them at the, but I'll, I'll resend them. Well, yeah, you know, I, I do have your 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 brief bio that you did send me. Yeah. And your your list of links was uh, longer than your bio. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and you know, uh, are you currently working on anything? And if so, how close to completion is it? Well, as I said, the, there's a short one in the, the training clans uh, with pirates. Arr. Arr. Well, they're, they're very bad pirates. Uh, Is there a good pirate? Eh, well, I don't know. The ones in Gilbert and Sullivan are usually pretty amusing, at least. Well, yeah, but I mean, they're always trying to stick it to the man, right? So they're good yeah. pirates. Yeah. Um, but these these are bad pirates. Um <laughs> I want to try and get that one out uh, in probably early, early next year, but it's also going to have the Karina project will be in there. And then, cause it's a 75,000 words right now. So just a baby. Um, and I'm working on some uh, short things for some themed anthologies. Um, I have, several other novellas in the uh, Assassin's Justice series. Um, uh, Confession is out. Uh, he has to tell his girlfriend what else he does for a living. <laughs> and a standalone duology that's sort of a thriller romance. Um, I do like to invent worlds because, you know, some of the things just don't work on Earth as it is. So, Is that something that's easy for you to do, building worlds? Oh yeah, I I love that. You know, I go, okay, well, hey, we've got this this idea. So is that it straight is from your mind or do you use a program or Yeah. No, I, I I'll take what, what idea I've had and go, okay, what kind of world gave rise to this situation? Mm -hmm. Um like in, in the duology that the thriller romance, the country that my main character lives in is a is a monarchy and there are people who want to get rid of the monarch and there's the, the queen who wants to get rid of other people and 
you know, so you have to build that world that it, it makes sense that the story could happen there. Sometimes I, I'll try putting a story into a particular world and you can usually tell fairly early on that it's just not, it just clunks. It just, <laughs> it, it, it's forcing it to, to be there. Um, so uh, then you sort of give up and go, okay, new world. How do we, <laughs> what game have you ever, here? have you heard of, um, I think it's called Anvil World Builder. Um, not offhand, no. Uh, so A N V I L World okay. Builder. Uh, I think they have a, a free option in it, and then there's different tiers, of course. You know how those things work, but you might want to look into that because it's it is a world builder yeah. for novelists okay. as well as gamers. Yeah. Well, one of the things you also need when you're when you're building a world is a map. Yes. And you have to know how far it is to, to get, you know, to get from A to B. Yep. And if you're on horseback, it's going to take longer than if you have a car. Uh, yes. Or if you're walking, hiking, swimming, jogging. If it's winter or summer. And how many mountains are in the way? Well, yeah. And how many known paths are through the mountains? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it, that's one of the, the, things that can bump me out of a story when there's a series if they say okay you know fantasy series so we're, we're dealing with horseback and you know wagons and whatnot and it takes three days of hard riding to get from a to b yes okay and that's during the summer yeah in another book it takes two days in winter and you're like no it should take two weeks <laughs> If you're lucky and you don't freeze. Well, your horse has got skis, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> um, question number three, and please don't get mad at me for this because most people do. If you had to choose one of your books or poems as a favorite, which one would it be and why? For the poetry, uh, the fir tree, which is why I chose to read that one last um the idea for it came from a meditation on past lives and whenever i reread it it's like yep so this is also one of the reasons why i don't do live christmas trees <laughs> that have been cut down uh, you're going to find out about that in a minute but i've sure. also written um now a prose version of that where where we're following the the tree um, for prose, I, I really like, I think my, my current favorite <laughs> is uh, the, the coalition of shifters novels. Okay. Um, I wanted shifters who were mostly regular people, um, not slavering monsters that you find in most TV and movie versions. And I wanted a long history in the world. You know, where did they come from? You know, how, how did they get there? And also they maintain the same mass. So you've got a 150 pound guy turns into a 150 pound cougar. Not this 400 pound werewolf that's also gained a foot and a half. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah, I, you, you kind of go. Eah. So that, that was actually a little problem I had with the small shifters story was because it had to be a small animal. Yeah. And actually I started writing, I think two or three different ones where there were small animals, but they actually grew too long for the, uh, the what was needed for the anthology. Okay. It's a thing I, that tends to, the things grow. But yeah, I, I really like the, uh, the idea of the shifters. There's the lions, there's wolves and there's cougars. Um, I've, I know the the Siberian tigers are now hiding out in Alaska, and there's some jaguars down in Central America, but, um, you know, it's fun. It makes sense. Yeah. There's A also of... going to be one actually set in Alberta in the late 1800s. Okay. Yeah. Where or how can people connect with you, and is there a preferred method? Well, I have uh, Facebook, 
which is Lee F. Period Patrick. I also have an, a Gmail address, Lee F. Patrick 01, because uh, apparently there was some other person with Lee F. Patrick. Who knew? Uh, you do now. Yeah. Um, I had Twitter, but it's defunct, and I'm not going to be doing anything with that. Twitter wars. Yeah, I'm uh, thinking about Mastodon, but I'm not sure how that's going to play forward. But And then people keep saying, yes, you should go on Instagram. And it's like, ah. So I, I'm assuming TikTok is not one of them either. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know, the, you know, some people are really into it. And I'm like, you know what? No, um, it's just not me. I, I, oh, well. But, but. There is somebody that I interviewed for season two, and she's the mother of a preteen young boy who just had a, a birthday. And um, she is employing one of his friends to run her TikTok account. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, there, there's no kids around that I can... Uh... I can lean on for that. Uh, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. All right. So do you have one last poem before we start to wrap things up? Yeah. Uh, this is called The Fir Tree. I am seedling, nestling under the thick snow. I am fir, growing with my kind in the wild places. I am green, fading never to brown. The seasons pass over me, and I become tall and strong. I am feeling the wind as it blows through my needles. I am hearing the birds as they nestle in my branches. I am tasting the water as it drips through to my roots. The sun shines down on me, and I stretch upward to meet him. I am quiet, snow covering the ground around me. I am dozing waiting for the promise of spring. I am stretching, bending to and fro in the winter winds. The moon and the stars watch, and our thoughts are of the cold. I am feeling my branches move, but the wind does not blow. I am hearing sounds, but the birds have all fled. I am tasting water, but the earth is gone from my roots. The light I feel is not the sun, nor the moon, nor the stars. I am warm, but it is, it is not the spring sun that awakens me. I am weighed down with small creatures, but they do not move. I am afraid, but there is no one of my kind to hear my call. Small fires nestle against my needles, but do not burn. I am feeling cold and the snow lies trampled beneath me. I am hearing the wind mourning my passing as my needles fall. I am tasting death and the darkness that is not night that surrounds me. For what purpose have I been brought to this end? Cool. Very cool. I, uh, when we're done, I'm going to ask you something, but um, that is, that's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. In closing, what would you tell anyone who might be too afraid, you know, too afraid to take the first step towards being or getting published? Well, writing, that's the only thing in your writing career that you can control. You can't force people to publish your works or to read them. All you can do is write them and make them the best you can. I actually counted up, and I've had 37 pieces published in my career. There's the five novels and the rest shorter prose and poems. I didn't actually realize there were that many when I went to count them. <laughs> You're uh, welcome. Yeah. So I was like, wow. That said, once you have them written and possibly uh, edited either by friends or, or by a professional editor, you need to submit to publishers either for short fiction or poetry or, or to novels, whatever. You need to submit it. And, you know, the, the thick skin takes a while to develop. Um, yes, you might be rejected. 
It could be because they have bought work like yours recently. Could be because the work reminded them of something bad in their past. You can't control their response. Or they're having a bad day. When or they're, they're having it. a bad day. Um, my husband used to do acting. And he was turned down for a part in a movie. Because the moment the director saw him, he thought John Cleese. Mm -hmm. And he's not John Cleese. He acts like John Cleese sometimes. But, but that was the reason why he didn't get that part. You, you can't tell um, why they said no. But if they say in their rejection email now uh, that they'd like to see more pieces, keep sending them their work. But you need to keep writing new material, revising older pieces. You know, if people said, well, this bit seemed really clunky, then, okay, that's when you may need to hire the editor um, and and get somebody who's a writer to read the piece, not just your friends. Mm -hmm. Because your friends may say, oh, yeah, this is wonderful. Yeah, they and have the best intentions. They have the best intentions, you know, you know, with letting friends read things. Like I say, one of my friends is a psychologist. And th those poems with the young man who who's had a horrible past, he can say, "Okay, I need to you to look at it from these poems from this point of view. Here's his backstory. Now, do these poems make sense for the trauma he's experienced?" So I'm I'm not engaging him as the friend who's going to read the thing and say, "Yeah, I really liked it." I want the psychiatrist or the psychologist to uh, to read them. <laughs> um, and some people read horror. Some people read um, science fiction or fantasy. So you need to have an editor who will understand the tropes of those of those pieces. Yeah, because if you ask a horror editor <clears throat> to do your high fantasy, they may not understand the the genre or the nuances of the genre mm -hmm. yeah but you have to write fingers on the keyboard my writing goal is 700 words per day okay and generally averaged out over the year i get there so like your 365 poems within the year i'm aiming for 700 words within Average it out over the the days. Yep, yep. So, yeah, it, it's scary to send that first submission out, but don't s then sit and go. I'm I'm waiting for them to reply. No, <laughs> write other stuff. Keep writing. Yes, get your butt in the chair and your fingers on the keyboard, or pick up the pen, or however it is you write. Some people like um, programs to help them write. I just, you know, t start typing. Yeah. Uh, some people are pantsers. Some people are plotters. Figure out which one you are and just, you know, write it down. Absolutely. Absolutely. How many people say write when you, in, when you ask them that question? That's typically the, 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 the <clears throat> answer. Yeah, keep, just, just write. Just write. Yeah. <laughs> What do you do when you can't write or you get that, you know, uh, writer's block or whatever it is that people want to call it these days. Read something old that you wrote. Yeah. And that will jog your brain out of whatever, or just read something. Or listen to between the lines podcast and get ideas. Lines. No, that's, that's actually, yeah, no, just keep writing. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's a habitual, you, you need to get into that habit. Yeah. Because if you, you know, it takes what three weeks to break a habit, but only what three days to form a habit or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, every, every day and figure out what time of day works best for you. I mean, if somebody has got small kids, yeah, it's going to be whenever the kid's asleep and you don't actually want to do the vacuuming or whatever <laughs> laundry, <laughs> but sit down and, um, some people uh, like to write with other people around. There's social writing. Yeah. 
uh, getting together at a coffee shop or something. Of course, that kind of went with uh, COVID. One of the things that When Words Collide has has done over the in the past was to sponsor a social writing weekend, um, usually one or two a year. And basically, uh, the Delta Hotel South are wonderful people. That's where When Words Collide has been the, over the past few years. And basically, they let us have a room for free. Oh, nice. Because we're all going to eat there. They yeah. make more money off the room or more money off the dining hall than, than they do off. Or the drinks. And you just, you bring your computer, you bring whatever, and you write. And then you get together with people over lunch and dinner, and then you go back and write. It could yeah. be editing, it could be uh, doing new works. They've done them online um, as a Facebook event, that kind of works, but you're still at home there. So you can be distracted by things like the laundry and the kitty boxes and whatever the phone else. Ringing, somebody knocking on your door. Yeah. Um, but so some people just, they have to leave the house. So there's a lot of different things that people can try. You know, some people hate social writing. Yeah. They can't concentrate because there's too much going on around them they can't focus on on the on the screen but you gotta you just gotta try and find what works best for you yeah and until you do you know just keep exploring you know try writing a monologue try writing a poem try writing a a, a haiku a greeting card a greeting card yes uh they pay money for those i i know i know i've tried <laughs> <laughs> Lee, this has been fantastic. So much to take in, so much to to uh, go through again, and I will while I'm editing it. But um, very informative, lots of insight. Thank you very, very much for agreeing to do this and for your time, especially today. No, I, I'm just glad that uh, that I saw your your thing on Facebook and it was like looking for poets. I went, and there was actually that. But I'm not really a poet. Yes, I am a poet. I have written poetry. I are a poet. You are. are. I, I are poeting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, that is so good. Thank you again. And you know what? Have yourself a good rest of your day. That's not a yeah. request. Oh, yeah. I've actually got to get back to some, you know, <laughs> editing to do. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And just, um, it's been, it's been a great slice. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Between the Lines. We hope you enjoyed our discussion and were inspired to either start writing or to keep on writing. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes or guests, you can reach out to us by sending an email to randy.btlpodcast at gmail.com. Use comment or suggestion in the subject line. For a copy of the transcript of this or any other episode, just send us an email using transcript as the subject line and indicate which season and episode you would like a transcript for. Visit my website, therandylacy.ca, where you can purchase one of my books, read my blog, and yes, even hear every episode of this podcast. If you have enjoyed what you've heard and would like to hear more, click the Buy Me a Coffee button at the top right corner of the page to help cover the costs associated with keeping this show available to you. If you're ever feeling overwhelmed by the many lines in your life, take a deep breath and remember the wise words of Winnie the Pooh. Sometimes the smallest things take up the most room in your heart. Until next time, keep on keeping Between the Lines. <laughs>